Thank you so much, friends, for tuning in to Infertility and Me Pod. I am your host, Monique Farouk. So excited to be here with you as always. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of your day. Today, I have a fellow fertility warrior who you might already know on Instagram, on Instagram, but if not, you want to follow. Her name is Ashley. She is a lupus survivor as well as she has a fibromyalgia. And we'll get into Ashley's episode in a minute. She'll be joining us. But I wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for tuning in each week for the last nine months. We're almost at a whole year since Infertility and Me started. So I I appreciate you guys so much for your continued support. And for the new listeners, thank you so much for checking us out here on Infertility in Me podcast. If you're not already, follow Infertility in Me podcast on Instagram. I also have a YouTube channel, but that's more personal things. It's called Journey with the Farooks. If you're into YouTube content and blogs and all those types of things, I'm also keeping it updated with my trying to conceive journey for baby number two. And I will be also keeping updated on Instagram as well. So you can go on both places, get connected with me, stay connected with me. You can also text 443 Five six nine zero six four two. 569 642 if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, and you prefer to text over emailing. You can also email me at infertilityme at outlook.com. If you connect with me on Instagram, then you've probably seen me reshare some of Ashley's in posts and just shouting her out and things like that. She's so, so sweet. I love her to death. Love her to pieces. I love all you guys. But I just wanted to take a moment to give gratitude and space for Ashley because she does suffer from both lupus and fibromyalgia. And we had a fellow fertility friend um, ask me through the podcast text messaging to discuss with an expert or or a fellow fertility friend about their journey with fibromyalgia and lupus. And so I quickly got on Instagram and asked if anyone had the condition or knew someone. And so, so generously, Ashley offered her journey. And also shout out to the Pineapple Podcast content creator. She also um, reminded me that Ashley has both conditions and that she was recently on her pod episode as well at the Pineapple Podcast. You guys can check her out as well. And then I just want to give a quick Thank you to everyone who has left a review on iTunes. I appreciate you so freaking much. You have no idea because it definitely tricks the system into believing that I'm giving you guys all this awesome, fabulous, marvelous content. And so I thank you, friends, for doing that. Thank you for following on Instagram and and connecting with me there and connecting with me here on the podcast. So here's Ashley. Okay, so I'm back, you guys. I got my girl Ashley here uh, from Raging Against Infertility on Instagram. If you're not following her, make sure you do that. Hit that follow button. Ashley, thank you so much, love, for coming on and speaking with us about your fertility journey and your diagnosis and all of that stuff. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. So how how did you how did you guys meet? You and Hubby, how long you guys been together? We've been together for 14 years. Wow. And um, I know it's a long time. Mm. We we actually met through um, an online dating website Mm -hmm. when I had just turned, I think I was still 18 actually when I am, when I started talking to him. Um, So we met, we were both in college and um, we were actually both attending the same college, Florida State. Mm-hmm. And um, we both grew up in South Florida. Mm. Um, he grew up in Miami and I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. Ah. And we were both home for um, the summer break between, it was after my freshman year, after his sophomore year. Okay. Okay. And um, yeah, we met that way. Awesome. Awesome. I feel like back in the day, online dating was like still kind of taboo. And it, like now it's just like everyday conversation. It's almost the way to go because you can like screen people, you know, and it's some, and I, mean, I feel like a lot of women feel safer that way too. So that is so lovely. I love it. I love it. I love it. So when you guys, did you guys get married right away? How long did you wait until after college? 
we actually didn't get married until um, 2014. We met in 2006. So we had been together eight years before we got married. Um, we had wanted to get married sooner. We knew pretty quickly that we wanted to be together. Um, but with school and everything, um, you know, I, we both finished college and then, um, I wanted to move to Orlando to do my master's degree gotcha. in, um, in counseling. Mm -hmm. And, um, my husband ended up doing his also in, um, in business administration at the same school down in Orlando. Um, so we moved and did that. And then we were starting careers and things like that. So we didn't end up getting married until um, I was 27, I believe. So we've been married almost six years. It'll be six years in November. Awesome. That's amazing, though, that you guys gave space to each other to finish your, you know, career endeavors as far as schooling is concerned. That's, that's wonderful. And it's so I know that you have lupus and fibromyalgia. Can you explain a little bit about each condition in case someone is not completely sure? I have a cousin who has lupus, so I know what that is, but I'm not sure myself about fibromyalgia and the details of that condition. Yeah, so with lupus, um, lupus is an autoimmune disease. So uh, anything that's autoimmune is basically your body is attacking itself like it's something foreign. Um, so with lupus, um, it causes inflammation and pain, and it can be in any part of your body that you feel that. Um, for some people, it does attack their organs, particularly kidney function and heart function. Um, and it can affect like your skin, your joints, um, and stuff like that. For me, um, I started experiencing more like I was getting the muscle pain, which also can be fibromyalgia too, which I'll talk about. But um, I was getting a lot of muscle pain and feeling tired and fatigued and um, having those issues before I started treatment. Um, for me, before I found out what was going on, I was just, I almost thought I was sick in the beginning. Okay. Um, but it just kept going on for a long time. And nothing was going away and things kept getting worse. And the, um, like the areas of my body that would hurt, it ended up kind of spreading throughout my body. Mm. Um, so it started being more like my head, my neck, my shoulders, it started going down my arms and into my hands. It started going into my legs. Um, and I was trying to figure out what it was and it was kind of a long process for me to, to get diagnosed and figure okay. it out. And, um, with fibromyalgia, a lot of times I feel like even though they, they definitely aren't the same thing, mm -hmm. sometimes I'll think that what's acting up is my lupus and okay. I'll go to, I'll talk to the doctor about it and they'll be like, oh no, that's fibromyalgia. Wow. So sometimes I can't tell when I'm having pain, like what it's from. I know it's mm -hmm. one of those, but with fibromyalgia, um, it's this widespread musculoskeletal pain. So people will also have fatigue. Um, they'll feel like sometimes I'll get like brain fog. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I'll like have issues with memory and I'll forget words for things or I'll be kind of like sort of in my own little world. Like I can tell it affects my brain function. It affects mm -hmm. people's sleep and um, like their mood and things like that. And there are certain points on the body with fibromyalgia that can tend to cause pain and they're really all over. Like there's stuff in your neck and shoulders and in your lower back. And, um, you know, the doctor, sometimes when I go, will like start poking around and be like, does this hurt? Does this hurt? I'm like, yes. <laughs> like, and it feels like, um, it almost feels like when they poke you in that place, it kind of like radiates. Okay. Like I may not feel it right away, but it's like all of a sudden that it's like, it spreads and it, it hurts a lot. Like a nerve condition. Yeah. It, I it think it does. Like. Yeah. It does affect that. And what I was uh, reading when I was kind of preparing to talk to you is that some researchers think that it has to do with the way that your body processes pain signals, mm -hmm. the way that your brain processes that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's definitely, it's, it's physical, but it also affects you mentally. Cool. And um, you can have both, which I do. Um, you know, it's something, some people just have fibromyalgia, um, mm -hmm. which is enough in itself. Uh, and then 
you know, obviously autoimmune is its own thing too, but. Yeah, yeah. My son, I know you've probably seen it on Instagram. I posted before, Omar Jr. was born at 24 weeks, four days. And so mm-hmm. with premature babies that young, they their their nervous system hasn't completely developed. And so when you touch them, you have to touch them like and hold it because otherwise any kind of other touching, it hurts. So that's what made me think that fibromyalgia is a nervous system condition because yeah. that just that just triggered my thought about him being in the NICU. Like until they get about 28, 30 weeks, you have to touch them and touch them firmly and keep your finger in place. Like you can't move it around. Because I didn't know that. Yeah, even like wiping their butt can be uncomfortable for them. And he would whine a little bit because when they would clean out his um, intubation tube and stuff and, and get the mucus out, um, he would whine a little bit when they handled him because his, his nerves were uh, uh, immature and weren't fully developed. So that's what made me think of it. Wow. That's a lot to deal with, Ashley. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what's, 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 um, what's the, I guess the treatment process, like, do you have to take medication? How did, how was it managed? So, um, yeah, I do take medication for it. Um, I started, I was diagnosed, it'll be five years at the end of this year. Okay. Um, so I've been on, um, Plaquenil, which is actually made a lot of news with COVID because it's um, mm-hmm. hydroxychloroquine. Right, right. Um, so I've been on that for um, almost five years mm-hmm. and I take that um, twice a day. And then I've had, um, they've tried other things too, like for fibromyalgia. Um, I'm actually on Cymbalta and I'm on that for depression and anxiety anyway. Okay. But it, um, Cymbalta is one of the ones that some people will take it even if they don't have mental health issues because it's said to help some with, um, the pain of fibromyalgia. Gotcha. Okay. So I take that also. Um, and there have been times I've been on other medications for like muscle pain and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. I've been on other like immunosuppressant mm-hmm. medications before to try to manage it. What I'm waiting on now is I'm supposed to be on, um, injections okay. for immunosuppressing Um, so I'm supposed to be doing that. I'm having kind of a battle with my insurance because, because I am trying to conceive, there are Mm -hmm. only certain injectable medications that are considered okay for that. Okay. And I think my insurance wants me to take a different one. And my doctors are like, no, she can't do that. She's doing fertility treatment. So, um, that's going to be kind of the next phase of treatment for me because I found out during this process of trying to conceive that I have a second autoimmune condition um, that's affecting my spine. It's like uh, arthritis of the spine. Wow, wow. Does anyone in your immediate family have any of the conditions that you have? No. No, wow. No, that's kind of the crazy thing. I'm really the only one, at least that we've uh, seen so far. I mean, I've had relatives who've had arthritis, but not like autoimmune. Right, um, right, not the lupus and not the fibromyalgia. Okay, yeah, because I would, you know, sometimes a lot of those disorders and diseases are um are can be genetic like yeah EOS and endometriosis can be genetic um I don't know if you follow um Amy's trying to conceive journey she's pregnant now you ever seen her no. page? she was at, she was actually the very first guest I had on the pod she volunteered her story le- uh, almost a year ago and she has um endometriosis and when I was doing research for her episode I found that endometriosis can be genetic so that's why I was wondering if the fibromyalgia and the lupus um, with anybody else in your family with the same conditions. Wow. I know that was a lot, guys, but I just want to ask you to, to give you guys some background on both disorders. Auto- um, auto- I can't talk today. What's going on? Sorry. So Ashley give, um, gave us brief synopsis as much as possible um, of her conditions and if you're out there suffering. I did have someone text me. I don't know if you saw the story a couple weeks ago, but I had somebody text me about wanting to um, me to do an episode on it. So that's another reason why I wanted you to come on because Jessica from the Pineapple Podcast, when you did her episode a couple weeks ago, she yeah. said, you know, Ashley has it. And I was like, oh, shoot. Yeah, let me hit Ashley up. And so if you're out there suffering, I wanted to do that for you. And friend, whoever, your, whatever your name is, I don't know what your name is when you text me about it with the chatting. Um, I hope that you're listening and continue to listen through the whole episode so that Ashley can give you an idea of what it's like going through treatment with both conditions. And so that's what I want to move into. So you had the diagnosis of both the disorders before you got, before um, infertility. So did they tell you when you got diagnosed that it was going to cause infertility? 
How no. Go- um, and for me, it actually doesn't. Um, okay. Sometimes the medications that people are on um, can, I think methotrexate is one of them. It's okay. sometimes used for lupus. Um, that can impact your ability to conceive like while you're on it. So some medications can affect that. Mm-hmm, for me, mm-hmm. the reason that I have infertility issues is PCOS. Okay. Um, and we also have some male factor infertility, Mm -hmm. but, um, going into trying to conceive, I did know from my medical conditions that, um, we were told early on that it would be a high risk pregnancy regardless. Okay. Um, and that I would need to be working with maternal fetal medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. so a high risk specialist. I had one too, girl. Yeah. I know all about it. And you go in like every other, every other, you go in more often when you're high risk and you have a specialist maternal specialist, just letting you guys know if you ever uh, have that issue, but it's, it's really cool because you get to see the baby more often too when you're pregnant. So, okay. I'm gonna let you finish. (laughs) No, you're good. (laughs) Um, yeah, so we did know that part of it um, early on. So um, before I started trying to conceive, I actually met with a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And um, because I had talked to my OB and said, I want to get pregnant, but these are my health issues. And uh, they had said, you know, like, we're going to refer you so you can talk to them. Because I think they probably just didn't want the liability of telling me go ahead okay. without somebody checking um, everything. So I brought mm-hmm. Um, like all my labs and things like that to the maternal fetal medicine doctor um, over a year ago and just said, Hey, um, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. And here's like what I'm, here's all the meds I'm on and here's my labs. And um, he basically gave us the go ahead and said, you know, um, these medications, you can't be on these. It's fine. We'll work with it. Basically they said, you know, um, whatever it is that you absolutely have to be on for your health. Mm -hmm. He was like, you have to be on it and we'll just, you know, we'll just work Work around it. Um, So I was like, okay. And we just talked about how we would kind of mitigate the different risks and what they would be checking for. Um, I know they want me to do uh, baby aspirin. I think when I get to Mm -hmm. 12 weeks with a pregnancy, they would want me to do that um, because of some concerns that they have and they would be checking to make sure that, the baby's growing properly because one of the risks with lupus is um, intrauterine growth restriction. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so, you know, things like that. So we had a conversation about it ahead of time. And then once we got um, that doctor's blessing, my husband felt good about it because his main thing was like, I know you really want kids, but my thing is you and your safety. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and your health. So once we got the blessing from that, um, I went off birth control and we actually ended up finding out pretty soon after that, within a few months, Mm -hmm. um, that I had PCOS. Okay. I was going to ask you about the PCOS and when you got diagnosed. Okay. So you guys were already in the thick of things, really getting ready to start everything. Okay. Wow. So there was never any indication before with your PCOS. You know, a lot of, a lot of the other fertility friends always said he had like, you know, pain and he had all these symptoms. There was never a concern before. Did you not have a lot of symptoms with it? There were, um, I was on birth control for 16 years, which I think helped mask a lot of it. But I do remember, um, my mom took me to an OBGYN when I was probably about 15 or 16, because Mm -hmm. I got my first period at 12 and then I didn't get it again for two years. Wow. Absolutely nothing. And, um, my mom was concerned about that obviously. And, Mm -hmm. you know, took me to an endocrinologist, which at the time, I don't think they really did a whole lot of testing when I was young about that. And then she took me to the gynecologist and the gynecologist actually said to me when I was around 16, she said, you are like the poster child for PCOS. Um, I think because, you know, I was like a little bit overweight, which sometimes can be a thing, doesn't have to be. Um, wasn't having the regular periods, um, had some kind of, you know, hair growth in weird places, but I'm also okay. Cuban and Italian, which I was like, we're hairy people. Yeah, so. sure. I'm just saying, girl, my husband is South Asian girl. He got hair for days. Like it's crazy. Yeah. 
exactly. I just, it's so crazy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I, just like, oh, I don't know. You know, I'm like, we're all kind of hairy in my family. So it, it, right. and you know what? A lot of us women have hair, small hairs around our nipple and our areolas too. Yeah. A lot of people do. I do. And I, you know, I pluck them babies out, but you know, it's there. <laughs> and it's been like that since I was an adolescent. So I totally get it. But you, so it's like, you know, why would I ever think that that's an issue? You know? And I know other yeah. people who have the same thing. I get a hair or two on my chin, but my grandmother. Had oh, I do too. You know what I'm saying? Like my grandmother had hair on her chin. She had really long hair and stuff like that on my dad's side. So it's like, I wasn't even thinking about it. So I can understand how you would like not even yeah. have consideration. So I didn't, for that. Yeah. yeah, I didn't really pay that too much mind. We did do, um, we did an ultrasound at the time. I did like a transvaginal ultrasound. They didn't find any cysts, which you don't have to have to have PCOS. Okay. But when they didn't find any cysts, they were just like, okay, go on birth control right. to just regulate your period. And um, I wish looking back that they had tested hormones and that maybe we had done more. Mm -hmm. um, but they just had me go on birth control because that's kind of how they seem to treat PCOS anyway. Yeah. A lot of the time. Oh, look at your puppy. <laughs> I don't want him marking his territory in my office. Cause he, <laughs> I think I heard you say that on a podcast recently <laughs> because he like, I, I, you know what it was? It was on Millie's episode. If you listen yes. to Millie's episode that I was on, because he's always competing with the baby scent being all over the house. And so like, he just start marking and stuff. I have to hold him for a minute because he's, he's out of this world. He does his own thing. That's so funny. Oh my gosh. So when you guys got all those things in the clear, I know your husband was like, so, so worried because you already have other two other conditions. Then you find out about the PCOS. And then, so did you, how did you guys navigate going into starting your IUI treatments and stuff? Did you take some time to process and figure out your timeline? Like how did that all um, transpire for you guys? So um, I had gone back to my OBGYN and, and said, you know, I'm off birth control now. I'm not having a period. She went ahead and um, put me on Provera, which is progesterone. Mm -hmm. And basically you take that for 10 days. And then once you stop taking it after a certain amount of time, you, you usually will have a bleed if everything is okay with your okay. hormones. Okay. Um, so I, I did and I said, okay, well now I'm having a period uh, from this. What, what do we do now? And they were like, oh, see if you ovulate, take a prenatal, good luck. And I was like, hmm. I just don't, I had no confidence that I would ovulate on my own, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which it turns out I'm correct about that. Um, and I talked to some friends who had gone through infertility issues and they were like, go see a reproductive endocrinologist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't so, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, so we did, we decided that's what we would do. And I, um, I saw one and it didn't really work out. She did give me the diagnosis of PCOS. She started me on metformin. Mm -hmm. um, and she basically said, look, you know, I don't think that you ovulate on your own. It doesn't seem mm -hmm. like you do at all. Um, so you would need fertility treatment and you would need to be taking like a Femera or Clomid or something like that. Um, but she was like, I'm not going to give that to you because of your BMI. Mm. And I was like, well, I kind of wish you told me that like the first time you saw me, but, um, mm. I was like, okay. And, um, you know, she was more into me doing very specific diets, like okay. very specific ones that she was into. And, um, I didn't feel comfortable with that cause I have a history of eating disorders. And I said, gotcha. look, I'm, gotcha. I'm willing to see, um, a registered dietitian and work with mm. them which is something I do now. And um, I said, I'm willing to do it that way. And, and we can do that. And she was like, no, it has to be like, she was very specific about Real it. Rigid. Okay. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, this really isn't, um, this isn't the person for me because she's not understanding what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of her way or the highway. So I ended up seeing um, my second doctor who I'm with now and sat down with him. And um, he basically looked at all the labs and stuff she had done and said, agreed with her that um, he's like, I don't think you ovulate or at least not in any way that we can predict. Okay. So he's like, my thing would be, let's do Femera or Letrozole. Gotcha. And I said, well, are you going to let me do that? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the first person told me no. And he was like, that's what I do. 
Mm-hmm. Like, this mm-hmm. is my job. And I was like, okay. okay so yeah. um, <laughs> I was right. like, okay, great. So, right. um, and I've been, and I started also working with a registered dietitian who has a lot of experience with PCOS and um, kind of learning how to eat for that because I do have insulin resistance and you have to just monitor the amount of carbs that you take in at a time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and make sure you're focusing on like protein and healthy fat and kind of cover those carbs, as my dietitian says, like with that. Wow. Wow. So, um, you know, just eating in a more specific way, which yeah. um, has been helpful. So I started doing that and we started doing um, letrozol cycles with um, timed intercourse and they do ovulation monitoring. And um, we did four of those. And on the fourth one, I did um, get pregnant. And um, which really surprised us because the first, after like the first three cycles, um, I was just kind of like, I think I was frustrated because I felt, I think in my mind, I thought, oh, I just need a little bit of help and like, we'll be good. I just need mm-hmm. a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And thankfully for and or Letrozole has worked really well for me. And I do ovulate on it and always have like once we started it, but, um, you know, it just wasn't happening. And then when it happened on the fourth cycle, we were just, I was totally blown away. Um, we had our first beta, uh, mm-hmm. test and confirmed with our doctor. They said I was pregnant. And then I went in for the second one and the doctor called me, um, the following day and said, you know, I'm sorry, but the HCG level has dropped down to 10 and you're going to have a miscarriage. Mm-hmm. So um, that was really difficult because I was just like, I couldn't believe we had finally gotten pregnant. Because by that point, I think we had been trying for about 10 months. Okay, okay. Um, Which is still, in some circles, not a lot. But um, for us, because we had been doing treatment and trying to figure this out most of the time of that 10 months, it was kind of, um, it felt like a lot. And um, so... Yeah, we, um, I had a hard time with that. That was really difficult emotionally and, and still is something I'm kind of processing. processing yeah, yeah, yeah. That I don't think it's ever anything you really, um, like you heal and you yeah. to, to deal with it, but I don't think it'll be ever anything that you won't have a pinch about, you know, when you think about it, you know, it's no different than losing a, a child that's, that's a stillbirth loss or a child. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's it's still the same thing because you had an attachment to the idea of and the and the and baby itself and the fetus and stuff. So I definitely get it. Did you guys wait a little while before trying again? I know you have to let the did you let the miscarriage pass on its own or did you um you did? Okay. Yeah, yeah we did. Um I was pretty early on. I was probably about five weeks. Okay. Um and it did um, happen on its own. And then my doctor did an ultrasound with me after the fact and just made sure everything was okay. Right. Um, and that, you know, we, we were okay to try again. Um, he basically had said, like, once you start having this miscarriage and bleeding, like, that's your cycle and you can do this again. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was not... I really wasn't sure what to do. And I felt like I didn't have a lot of time to decide. My husband was very supportive and he was like, we can do whatever you want. He was like, I, you know, I'm leaving that up to you. That's your decision. Um, and I didn't get pressure from anybody to do it. I just felt like I wasn't really sure what to do. And then for me, I, since I, um, don't usually get periods on my own, I do get them when I ovulate. Okay that's been kind of the missing piece for me is that um once I started letrozole cycles I started getting regular periods because I was ovulating um so I was like well I have a period and if I don't like take these drugs and ovulate this cycle does that mean I'm gonna like mess up Mm -hmm. the whole pattern of what we've been doing so I was just like I'm just gonna do it I'm just gonna take the letrozole and go through with it and I was like if we get to the point where we have to try and I don't feel like doing it, then we just yeah. won't. But um, we did try, we didn't get pregnant that cycle. And then actually the next cycle after that, they said, you can't do it because you have a cyst on your ovary. Okay. 
So that was kind of good because I got, I think I needed a break, but I wouldn't have taken one. Mm-hmm. I think I felt, I felt for a long time and I, I know now that this is not true, but I think I felt like if I just work hard enough, I can make this happen and I can somehow work my way into a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and if my body hadn't said like, you need to stop, I think I would have just kept working myself into the ground and that's not the best thing for me mentally or physically. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny how we like take on the same attitude as when we are fulfilling a goal, like you getting your master's degree, like hubby getting his master's degree and stuff. Yeah. It's funny how we take that role on with trying to conceive too. Oh my gosh. It's so, it's, um, <laughs> it's so crazy. What is human nature? And we live, like you said, you know, yeah. the universe made it so you didn't have no choice but to stop and take a break. And, you know, I always say that the body is much smarter than we are. Mm-hmm. Like, the body knows much more, you know, about life than we do. So it does. how long did, how long was you guys' break? Because I know you had to get um, a procedure done to have the cysts looked at and removed and all those kinds of things, right? Is that how it normally goes for you? Um, with we, um, with mine, actually, they put me on birth control for a month mm-hmm. and that took care of it. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Um, so that was great. Um, I went on birth control for the month of June oh, and- yeah. I think that was really good for me just because, um, you know, mentally it had just been such a difficult time and it's so stressful as, as we all know, if you're going through this. Um, and I, I definitely needed the break. And I think in that month off, I was like, I kind of found that like I was still there. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes I felt like I lost myself in this whole process because it is so consuming. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I was like, oh, I'm still in here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was good. I like that. I'm going to make a note. I'm going to name the um, episode that I'm still in there. So oh, I love that. Yeah, I get like, little ideas like that when we're talking. I love that. I love, love, love that. Yeah, that's going to be the episode name, guys. And that was this past June, wasn't it? Was that just this yes, past June? Yes, it was. Yeah, okay. I remember reading it on your, on your stories and your posts. I know you do a lot in stories, so I usually watch your stories. Um, um, what's I going to say? Um, so July is gone. Anything new happened in July with your protocol or your treatment plan going forward? Yes. And I'm sorry if you hear that noise. No, it's all good. (laughs) Such is life. (laughs) That's my work. I am that's being loud. Um, sorry, I'm disconnecting from that so that it doesn't make more noise. Um, so yeah, July, I actually sat down in June with my doctor when we were on that break and said, you know, I've really, I've really just felt this pull to try IUI. Okay. Um, and I've been feeling it for a long time and I was kind of doing, at one point he had said to us that we should do six cycles of the Femera and timed intercourse. Mm -hmm. And once we got to, we had done five. Um, and when we, we had the one canceled, I was like, I'm kind of done. Um, so I, I reached out to him and sat down with him and said, what do you think about IUI? And he said he was fine with us doing that. Um, he said that had actually kind of been his plan all along, but I think it got, I think we kind of got lost in a, they, I'm sure they have a lot of patients and B, Mm -hmm. it kind of threw them off. He said when I got pregnant and then we kind of started all over again. Yeah. Um, so it just, it definitely showed me you really have to be on top of them because they do have so many other people and it's like, nobody is going to remember all your Everything stuff the way you. that you do. Yeah. 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 And, um, or be as invested as you are, yeah. uh, in the same way. So he was like, yeah, let's do IUI. So we did the first one, um, last month. And, um, unfortunately it wasn't successful, but I am glad that we did it. Um, my next one is going to be in a couple of days. Okay. So our plan is for now is to do three. Okay. Um, that's kind of what we had planned with the doctor. We haven't really talked about what would happen beyond that. Um, I'm personally willing to do more than the the three if the doctor feels that that's, um, smart just because I think my, the way my husband and I both feel is that we got pregnant with less intervention back in April. Mm -hmm. Um, 
which I'm still kind of like, how did we do that? Because um, <laughs> my husband, we found out um, a little bit before we got pregnant that my husband has some male factor infertility. It's um, his morphology was at like 2%, meaning okay. that 98% of them are not shaped the right way. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. the motility was pretty low. It was like in the 30s, 30%. Yeah. I think a um, lot of times if the, if the morphology is off, the motility is going to be off because that's true. you know, sperm, they, they kind of like spin like a drill in, in yes. a through direction. So it makes sense that if the morphology is a little off, that the motility is going to be crazy, a little wanky too, because of the yeah. way that they're, that they, you know, they move and such like that. Did they, so I'm going to ask you about um, how, when they, when they test and diagnose hubby as having some motility and morphology issue, did they test again to like be reassured that that's really an issue or maybe just maybe that particular ejaculate, you know what I mean? They didn't do it again. Um, we did look at it a little bit with the IUI because they do have to clean that sample. And when they did that, it cleaned up really well. And after they did that, he had 80% more, um, 80% motility. Good. Good. Yeah. yeah. So that was really good. Um, and my doctor has said before, he'd be like, I'm interested. I would be interested in running it again. Um, we haven't done that yet, but, um, my husband's been taking a bunch of vitamins and stuff like fertile and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That thing, those things work, you know, um, help. Because like I'm, I am a believer in supplementation for the things that we don't normally get in our diet every day. You know what I mean? Because let's face it, you know, we have our cakes and our pies and we have our oh, sure. fried foods. You know what I mean? So we not, it's impossible to get everything unless you're like plant-based and even with plant-based, you still got to take B12. You still got to make sure you're eating quinoa to get your protein in. You know what I mean? So it's like supplementation is helpful and it's, and it's great when you're taking the right things and it's, yes. and with men, it's so much easier if they don't have, as long as they don't have like azospermia where they don't have any sperm at all, it can be corrected with their diet and making sure that their testosterone levels are normal and stuff, you know, because they always produce some sperm. We get our eggs and we're born and then that's it, you know? That's so true. Yeah. You know? So that's why that's I, was, I was, yeah, yeah, for sure. So how do you feel about you guys' next step in going into your first IUI? Are you excited? Are you nervous? Are you everything? How are you feeling? So this is, um, this is actually our second. Oh, that's right. That's right. It is. And um, yeah, I'm, it's funny. The first one, I was really excited because I think it's a new thing and I wasn't sure mm -hmm. what to expect. The second one, I think I'm kind of, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, mm -hmm. but I think when the first one didn't work, it was really hard for me to process mm -hmm. and it kind of lowered my expectations a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we still believe it can work for us possibly, but mm -hmm. um, I think I'm just kind of like, okay, I'm just gonna. Cautiously hopeful. <laughs> yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do this and um, we hope that it works. But, you know, my husband's been saying like, even if it doesn't, like it doesn't mean a future one could not work. Um, like so we're trying to kind of keep that hope alive. And my husband's a really realistic guy. So I think mm -hmm. I'm, I, I feel reassured when he says things like that, because I know if he was like, this is never going to happen, he would just tell me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just I totally real with me yeah. and be like, no, this isn't gonna work. We need to do something else. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're cautiously optimistic about it, and we're hoping this is our turn. But if not, um, we'll definitely do the third one, and then we'll see from there yeah. um, what the doctor is thinking about what we should do. Yeah, I'm always for the less invasive form, for as long as possible. You know, um, I think I would probably do. I did want an IUI, but if I could do IUI again and do it a couple of times, I would think I would be like you. Let's try it as much as possible and then go from there. Um, but of course, I've had the IVF experience too as well, but sure. I was on I was on a mild cycle of IVF. So even that was less invasive than, you know, a lot of our other friends on Instagram who have like so many medications and all these things and shots and stuff so but oh that's so wonderful i'm so glad for you guys and i'm i got you know i got everything crossed for you girl and you. um i appreciate you coming on and sharing with us your medical conditions to help another friend out and and giving us all those great details 
Um, you're so knowledgeable. You know how to pronounce all the medication names. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's so cool. I love it. So give us your um, Instagram handle for those who want to connect with you on Instagram further. Sure. So I'm at Rage Against Infertility. So it's rage under at rage underscore against underscore infertility. Yes. Thank you, friends, for tuning in with us on Infertility and Me podcast. You just listened to Ms. Ashley Hensington and her journey with fibromyalgia, PCOS, and lupus and her fertility journey. Again, follow her. Make sure you connect with her further if you're in a similar situation with similar conditions, or if you just want to say, hey, reach out to her. She's really sweet, and she'll get back to you when she can. Thank you so much for joining.